this um, this uh, image that I have is the cover of my second book, and I just wanted to say that it is a memory. When I was a child, uh, I would run down for breakfast, and if there were empty bowls on the table, then that meant that there were enough berries outside to go pick a bowl and have for breakfast. So we'd take our bowls and we'd run outside and we'd uh, fill the bowl, and mom would uh, coat it with cream and a little bit of sugar. So uh, fresh berries picked right out in nature was a wonderful memory to have growing up on the reserve. Okay, I'm going to talk about legends themselves. The legend takes place at the beginning of time. It takes mythic beings to transform our reality to what it is today, an entertaining explanation of how things have become the way they are. Legends can be classified into four groups. There's cosmic legends. They explain the beginning of time, astronomy, creation of the world, people, plants, and animals, mythical beings, basically all the beginnings. There are institutionalized legends. They teach cultural dogma, religious morals, laws, behavioral warnings, even things that are taboo. There are ritual legends resembling class. They teach the steps to something, the ways to do something, and the reasons why. And lastly, my favorite, entertainment legends. They're considered basically true, but have lost their sacredness over time. They usually have a culture hero much like a bedtime story or television. Legends teach in an entertaining way. As you listen, you are learning. I find with legends, once they are heard and laughed about, they are remembered. It is an effective way to teach. The best way to appreciate legends is to regard them as an expression of the culture of the people who created them. Legends continue from one story to another. They link to each other from one ending to another beginning. A legend in reality is from the beginning of time throughout the history of culture to the modernization of the world. The legends I hear always underline the number four. If told properly, there are events that happen within the legend that are significant to the path of the story. These events should be repeated four times. Whatever is going to happen in the progression of the legend happens the fourth time. If someone knocks at a door, they will knock one, two, three times, but the door will be open on the fourth knock. Four is an important number in First Nation culture. Almost everything is divided into groups of four. Four colors, four stages of man, four times of day, four basic elements, four directions. Four is uh, taught on a continuous basis throughout uh, indigenous life. There are three categories of indigenous people in Canada. Um, indigenous means Inuit, Métis, and First Nation all together. So uh, it's just a common term. And uh, when you're meeting a person individually, you either call them Inuit, Métis, or First Nation. In North America, excluding Mexico, it is divided into 10 separate culture areas. Six are within the borders of Canada. There are many different types of legends depending on the area of origin. Different lifestyles need different teachings. So I'm going to go over the different areas that are in Canada as an example of their life, an example of what kind of legends that they have. And we're gonna start with the Arctic. The most northern region on Earth, the land is sparse, covered almost entirely by water, and most of it is frozen. The sun rises in March and sets in December. Inuit were nomads, adapting incredibly to the environment. They travel by foot, and dog sled in the winter and kayak in the summer. They hunted polar bears, caribous, whale, seals. Most of the meat was eaten raw. 
In summer, they joined to together to form villages with tents. In winter, they broke into small family groups and lived in igloos. Life was very hard. You had to be tough. You had to be smart. The Inuit believed everything has a spirit. Legends were handed down to storytellers. Some legends are even based on history. Songs and dances enhance the telling. Sometimes small carvings were used as illustrations. Legends reinforced the close relationship with nature, taught customs, preserved ideas, and gave a sense of right and wrong. Inuit legends were entertaining, but very instructive. They are fairly intricate with tons of behavioral codes, warnings that people in such a strong environment need to understand. So uh, Inuit, um, I find with their legends that they are very straightforward. It is a life and death environment that they're living in, and you cannot learn how to do something. You have to know how to do it. So the legends that they had were very straightforward. If you didn't do something, you would die. If you didn't follow a moral uh, respect for uh, a god or a being that was in charge of animals, uh, sea animals, birds, that kind of thing, if you disrespected anything, you would die. The whole village would die. There was a lot of death, and that was just very straight warnings, because if you think of living in the Arctic, uh, if you take off wandering around, you're going to die. I also like that in the uh, legends themselves, no children are harmed. And uh, if children are in legends, they are, um, they, they, they came up and grew better, got revenge against people who didn't do them, turned into a better person. So um, children are considered very important and they can strive to be better. They have lots of warnings and uh, heroes. There is a legend called uh, Tiktaliktak, and it's about a young hunter who was on a journey, who became lost in an ice flow, and he found his way home, and it explains how he did that. Uh, Kualapalik are half human, half sea creatures that snatch children into the sea if they wander too close to the shore. So it's a, a warning. The most fam famous legend is about uh, Sedna. Our widowed man and his daughter, Sedna, lived a quiet life. When the girl came of age, her beauty was courted by men from far and wide. But a fulmer, that's a type of seagull with a shorter beak, started flying around her and singing to her, wooing her with her songs, her promising her a fantastic life. When she went with him, she found out that everything was a lie. The father came for Sedna in a boat. He killed the fulmer and they started making their way back. These uh, birds, these seagulls, they say they cry because of that happening. They're crying in mourning for their um, uh, murdered uh, companion. A storm rose and the frightened father offered his daughter to the sea. The storm calmed, but Sedna was bitter for what her father had done. When they got back, Sedna had her dogs attack the father and chew off his hands and feet. So the father cursed Sedna to go live in the sea, where she was pretty happy. She was quite satisfied with this, that. She became goddess of the sea and keeper of all the sea mammals. Now, if you uh, are out in life and you're wanting food, of course, uh, animals from the sea are very, very important. So you would pay proper respects to Sedna, ask her to release some animals uh, in your area to your favor. I found it uh, very interesting that it is important for Inuit to keep uh, the preparation of land, air, and water animals separate because you're respecting uh, that goddess of, of those type. So, um, Years later, I made friends with a butcher, and he told me that uh, when you use a knife, you're supposed to cut meats with different knives. You can't use the same knife to cut land or fish or bird. 
because it'll produce bacteria that, that will kill people. So that legend that said, don't do that, was actually life-saving and valid uh, even today. Okay, we're gonna move to the subarctic. Long winters cause permafrost across a 270 million hectare boreal forest. This boreal forest stores carbon, purifies air and water, and regulates the climate. Subarctic people were nomadic. They walked or snowshoed across long distances while loads were pulled into bog and spiked dogs or people. They were top hunters. Men did the big game hunting and women set snares fish and gathered. They lived in teepees, pit houses, and skin tents supported by whale bones or wood. Subarctic legends were highly valued and practiced in song, dance, and storytelling. Animals had great power and could take human form. Culture heroes faced this kind of world challenges. Nanabush had a human mother and a spirit father. Reminds me of the uh, Greek legends, Hercules. Nanabush was intelligent, he knew survival skills, and was smarter than anyone or anything he faced. Nanabush was sent to teach human beings how to survive, and along the way, he changed the sculpture of the world to what it is today. The gift of First Nations summer, or indigenous summer, was actually a race. Nanabush accepted a dare from his brother to race to the north and back, and every step carried a taste of summer right along with him. Legend says that they race every year. There is also a modern legend that prophesizes a time when the world would be sick and need elders to share knowledge of culture, from songs to dances to legends. They are called the Warriors of the Rainbow. Okay. Going to the Northwest Coast. It has white beaches, deep fjords, and mountains topped with snow. Powerful families govern villages. The people of the Northwest Coast had permanent settlements, significant wealth, and they were politically complex. Villages were close to the water, with houses facing the beach. The most important roles were hunters, gatherers, and carpenters. They had abundant land mammals, sea mammals, and waterfowl. The most valuable food was salmon. The most valuable resource was cedar. People lived in large plank houses. Those are posts with beams covered with cedar planks. One plank house could fit a hundred people. Huge cedar totem poles represented the clan, and their dugout canoes were 60 feet long with multiple paddlers and a steersman. Feuds were settled with gifts. Marriages were gift exchange. Gift giving and feasting was the main way that wealth was distributed. The potlatch was a lavish ceremony where possessions were given away to show wealth or enhance prestige. The mountains are considered sacred. They're the home of supernatural beings called thunderbirds. Flashing eyes of lightning, the wings flapping thunder. One was never to climb higher than the snow line of the mountains. Crafty animals became inspirations in early myths, animals had the same ability as man. Weaker, smaller creatures escaped larger ones with wit. Coyote was the weakest, but the smartest, and became known as the chief of all animals. Fox ranked second. Raven has many, has many, many legends in uh, BC culture. Um, Pacific culture, Northwest Coast culture. <laughs> Raven had many legends. And here's one of them. 
There was a time when Gray Eagle took care of the earth. He didn't like human beings. Human beings lived in darkness without fire. Raven fell in love with Gray Eagle's daughter and changed himself into a white bird to court her. Raven was invited into Gray Eagle's lodge and said and saw all the gifts of the world hanging on the walls. He knew what to do and waited for a chance when no one was looking. He snatched the sun, the moon, the stars, fresh water, and a coal of fire when no one was looking. He flew up through the smoke hole, and as soon as he was out, he released the sun so that he could see where he was flying to. He dropped the water, which formed lakes, rivers, and streams, and he kept flying when the sun was setting. He released the moon and the stars. He continued flying with the coal fire in his beak, which blackened his beak, and the smoke blackened his feathers. He couldn't hold it any longer and dropped it to the earth, where it hit a rock, sending sparks, which is how fire is created. Raven is honored in many legends of Pacific Northwest tribes. Okay. Plateau. It's along the western edge of the Rocky Mountains. People traveled on foot, canoe, snowshoe, and family groups with dogs for hunting. They lived in subterranean pit houses and in teepees. Spring, summer, and fall, they traveled. But they joined other groups in lodges for the winter in a permanent village. Each village had a number of chiefs or headmen. For example, there was a chief for salmon fishing. Decisions were made on the advice of elders. It is estimated that the Plateau people were the first ones to have horses. Plateau people had a deep connection with the environment. Everything around them had power, even rocks and trees. This relationship with nature filtered through every aspect of daily life. They loved games and stories. An elder in each village would recite legends and myths to the tribe. If the village had no storyteller, the shaman would tell the legends instead. And a teller would act out a story with his voice, his face, and his body. He might growl or roar or cry. Legends were told over and over again. When the stories were retold, the last sentence of the story is repeated so that everyone knows that they are listening. In legend, Coyote created human beings. A monster from the north was consuming all of life, so Coyote tied itself to a mountain, and when the monster arrived, it tried to suck up Coyote, but because he was tied to a mountain, he couldn't suck up the mountain with him. So he gave up and became friends with Coyote. One day, Coyote asked to see all that the monster had consumed inside its belly, and the monster agreed. So he opened up his mouth, and Coyote went in and saw all the animals of the world. He built a fire, and he cut from the inside, cut the monster into pieces, and the animals escaped. He said in honor of this event, he would create a new being. Drops of blood from his hands, fell into clay, and he molded them into human beings. All right, then we go to the woodlands. Very intricate, very, very intricate uh, culture. The woodlands are a large region covered by thick forest with lakes, rivers, including the Great Lake. There is an abundant food source. Most important thing, women planted and harvested Men were made to clear forests for farming. The largest part of their diet was from their own fields. Fishing and hunting and gathering supplemented these domestic crops. Fur bearers, especially beaver, were significant for trade. Some communities cultivated and harvested wild rice. Others also collected maple or birch sap. Crop storage was permanent in these sediments. A typical village had longhouses, and it was protected by a huge wall. 
Anywhere from a few families to towns with as many as 2,000 people live together. I mean, this place was uh, literally a, a major city in itself. And people were uh, settling up as if nowadays, I mean, they were storing their own food. Um, they traveled in birch car bark canoes in winter, and in winter used snowshoes, sleds and toboggans. Trade and visiting appeared to be common activities. Some culture heroes are Nana Bojo, or Gluskab. Heroines were Sky Woman and Nokomis. The uh, culture heroes have a positive view of human beings and want to help them. They change the world in human beings' favor. They fight monsters and help teach culture. culture. They might be mischievous or silly, but they are not dangerous or malicious. Even if they are not taken seriously, they are respected. Animals play a huge role in legends. And this uh, is their legend of the game of lacrosse, how it was made. Long ago, there was a great ball game between four-legged animals and birds. The four-legged animals had the bear for power, the deer for speed, and the turtle who could not be moved. The birds had the owl for sight, hawk for speed, and the eagle for strength. Squirrel and mouse wanted to join the game, but they were too small to be with the animals, and they couldn't fly. The birds felt pity and fashioned wings of hide on mouse. So mouse became bats, and they stretched out squirrel's skin to use his wings. So they were both able to join the team. Although the animals were bigger, the birds were able to control the ball in the air. Eagle passed the ball to squirrel, who passed the ball to bat. Bat's motions of dodging and circling kept that ball in the air, and they scored the winning goals, a victory for the birds. So the uh, actual action of grabbing that uh, ball in the air and passing it back and forth, that's lacrosse. Okay, and finally, we get to my favorite area, the plains. We're a lot more laid back on the plains. Uh, grassland is stretched as far as the eye could see. Uh, there's a group of people traveling according to the seasons and availability of food. There are valleys, forests, along with lakes and rivers. They foraged, fished, and hunted. They were able to grow small gardens in certain areas, and the buffalo was a main supply of food. It is estimated that before contact, buffalo numbered 30 million. The entire buffalo was used. Pemmican was made of dried and pounded meat mixed with berries and fat. It could last for years and it was introduced to voyagers to uh, help them survive Canada. People lived in villages all working together, each donating their service to the village. Teepees were the main dwelling, a tent with fire inside. A cone of poles was covered with bison skin that was sewn together. A vent at the top would cycle the fresh air through the tip and collect smoke to the open tops that had air flaps. An entire village could be broken down and ready for travel in a half hour. The TV pools, poles were used as framework for the trap wall. Snowshoes were used during the winter. The Plains people are credited with the first powwows, an event featuring music and dancing. They even invited other indigenous nations to join the celebrations. Drums represent the earth or the circle of life. The sound goes into the ground and lets the elders know that we remember them and we still practice our culture. With the Plains people, there is a creator or great spirit that had power over all things in nature, including people, animals, vegetation, climate, and land. The people offered thanks to the creator. The earth is believed to be the mother of all spirits much like Mother Earth is considered today. And most individuals carry their own medicine bags, which have personal items, dried herbs, a pipe, and tobacco. People ask for help from spirit guides,
an individual would find their representative guardian spirit in a fast. They go alone to an isolated spot where they fast and pray until a guardian spirit appeared in a dream or a vision. Like most indigenous people, the nation of the plains believe that spiritual powers are everywhere and in everything, in objects as well as in living things. And the main character is Wisigajak. He's not too bright, he has childlike impulses. He's given a lot of credit for the way things are. He was egotistical, but he had great power. An enjoyable mythical being featured in almost every legend that is told. I grew up listening to the legends of Lisa Gajak. As I became educated in schools, I confronted these theories with science and logic. But knowing that they reflected my culture gave them a permanent place in my life. And I'm going to tell you uh, a few legends about Wisigacha. So we will uh, find out uh, how birds got their colors. <coughs> oh my goodness. Okay. Wisigacha paints the birds. Uh, Originally, birds were just plain, boring, there was nothing to them, flying around the world. Okay. The legend goes, Wisa Gajak was looking at the world and decided that it was boring. It needed color. He noticed the birds flew everywhere. The best way to color the world would be to color the birds. Wisa Gajak announced a powwow where he would paint the birds whatever they wanted to be. And on that day, paint pots were full. Birds were flying and singing and getting in line. One wanted a red, just like the morning sunrise, on its chest, and that is the robin. One wanted a deep berry red from head to tail, the cardinal. One wanted to be as blue as the sky, the blue jay, and one wanted to be all the colors, the hummingbird. And yet, two birds were sleeping away the day in a hole in a tree were owl and crow. Owl thought it would take time to paint all the birds. Owl was lazy and decided to go last. Crow was daydreaming. Crow watched birds fly by and imagined a masterpiece. He would pick all the colors offered, stripes, dots, zigs, and zags, one idea after another. He was sure he would be the most magnificent of them all. Crow dozed off to sleep. When they woke up, the sun was setting. The day is over. Crow could fly faster, so he rushed ahead for the both of them. When he arrived, Wisigajak was packing away supplies. Crow looked so sad, and Wisigajak pitied him. He gave Crow the only paint left, black as the night sky. Anything that Owl and Crow painted for themselves stay forever. Crow was thrilled and took the paint back to his friend. Crow was impatient and wanted to paint first. Owl stood still as Crow dipped the brush and painted each feather, one at a time. It took a long time and was a beautiful job. Crows are very talented and if you have ever seen a snowy owl, you would agree. Now it was Owl's turn to paint. Crow took a wild stance still. Owl tried to paint the back. Crow moved. Is it done? No, it's not done. Stay still. Owl tried to paint the tail. Crow moved. Is it done? No. Owl tried to paint the wings. Crow moved. 
Is it done? Is it done? No! Owl tried to paint the front breast. Crow moved. Is it done? Yes, said Owl. It's done. He picked up that paint pot and dumped it over Crow. Owl flew away and to this day has nothing to do with crows. Crow flew into the deepest parts of the forest, angry and bitter, jealous, and cawing out to the world. To this day, crows are loud and usually only friends with other crows. Right. I'm gonna move on to uh, another uh, legend. Uh, this legend, is a classic boogeyman story to get kids to stay close to home and in before dark. Every culture has them. The legend of, of the Wendigo is respected for an additional reason. Uh, in many legends, Wheezy Gajak may come off as comical, but this is a reminder of how great Wheezy Gajak was. He has faced entities, monsters, and villains in great, elf, uh, in great battles. His legend is still spoken about today. So uh, this is Weezy Gay Jack Battles of Wendigo. That's my Wendigo. That's my idea of a Wendigo. <laughs> the legend goes, Wendigos are bitter, hollow, cold, and lonely. They look for the light and warmth of people. If you lock eyes with a Wendigo, you are frozen still, and that would be the end of you. But don't worry, they are easy to avoid. Don't wander far from home and be inside before it gets dark. A Wendigo wilts everything around it, so their camps look old. Scouts noticed a Wendigo camp close to their village. They called Wisigajak for help. He knew it would be dangerous, so he packed his knife for the trip. Soon he found the Wendigo, busy gathering wood, and snuck up from behind. It turned and froze Weezy Gajak in the gaze of his eyes. Mmm, said the Wendigo. Looks like I'll have Weezy Gajak stew for dinner. The Wendigo put more logs on the pile. Careful to stay eye to eye with this frozen captive. Weezy Gajak couldn't move a finger or a toe, but he could yell. He began to call for help. Help! 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 The Wendigo watched from a distance and laughed. Only one animal was in the area. Medium size, black as a shadow from tip to tail. It was a skunk who heard the call. He followed the sound and came to the standoff. Skunk snuck close to Weezy Gajak and whispered, What can I do? Weezy Gajak whispered back, It has to close its eyes. I'll keep it busy so you can attack. Skunk nodded. This was their partnership. The Wendigo kept moving, so Weezy Gajak would have to get its attention. He decided to tease it. Do you need help building a proper fire? The Wendigo huffed. No. Hmm. You seem to be a small-sized Wendigo. It growled. I'm big enough. Am I supposed to be afraid of you? It shrieked, you're supposed to be quiet. It was easy to find you. You leave a really bad smell. The Wendigo stopped, turned, and stared hate into Weezy Gajak. And in that second, Skunk leapt and bit the Wendigo hard, right on the butt. The Wendigo screamed in pain and shut his eyes and suddenly, Weezy Gajak was free. This 
Skunk bit off a chunk of, a chunk of that butt. It grabbed Skunk and threw him into the bush. The Wendigo swiped and we see HF chopped off a finger. It turned into a tiny Wendigo with wings and started attacking. The Wendigo kicked. We see HF chopped off a toe. It turned into a tiny Wendigo with wings and still attacked. The battle lasted all day. The Wendigos got smaller and smaller and smaller. We see HF fought until there were millions of tiny Wendigos. They decided to escape and flew off into the woods. Today we call them mosquitoes. Poor skunk had a terrible smell. That chunk he swallowed made his farts stinky. We see Ajak was proud of skunk and sorry he couldn't help. Wendigo is very strong, but he could protect. So he pet skunk from head to tail. Good job. That touch left a mark for the whole world to see and respect. And if you don't, Skunk will teach you exactly what a Wendigo smells like by spraying on you. P.U. Mosquitoes are tiny pieces of Wendigo from that battle. Still trying to escape, still fighting, still biting. And if you want to help Wiesigate Chuck battle a Wendigo, clap those mosquitoes. Um, I'm going to need a copy of the book. We're going to do an extra legend. Yes. The red, no, no, the book, the actual book. We'll tell another one. I've seen Wendigos in movies. Stephen King wrote a book about Wendigos and that, but to me, that's, that's the story of Wendigos. So although they're really scary, and, uh, to me, they were kind of uh, comical. So <laughs> yeah, it's a very, a very different way of teaching. So I'm going to tell an, uh, another legend, and it's called Why Ducks Waddle. Jack was wandering around the world when his belly began to grumble. He realized he was hungry. At the edge of a lake, he saw a team of ducks. We see Gay Jack called to them. Ducks, I know your family. Come and say hello. The ducks knew not to get close to anyone they didn't know. We don't talk to strangers, no. We see Gay Jack was angry and demanded that they listen to him. The ducks said, no. We see Gay Jack acted sad and hurt and asked them for help. A grown person doesn't need help from a little duck. No. What do you think this legend is teaching, eh? <laughs> okay. Gate Jack decided to try a trick. He cleared his throat and made an announcement. <clears throat> I, the great Gate Jack, have been beaten by ducks. In their honor, I will have a powwow in their name. He reached into his medicine bag, pulled the fire out, and set it up. He pulled out a teepee, a drum, and a drumstick then stepped back. The ducks were curious because everything was so interesting. They forgot to be careful and went closer to look at the items. They decided to walk into the teepee. How wonderful it was to have a powwow in their honor. 
Yes, yes, yes. When I'm telling this legend, I'm, I'm telling the kids um, all of these different kinds of warnings. Uh, it would be equal, the same kind of warnings that you would give to kids today. Don't get in the car. Uh, that they offer you things. Do you want to see a puppy? That kind of thing. These kind of legends uh, still have the same messages that warnings that parents give nowadays. And you can see the big difference where uh, my mom was saying that uh, morals are taught through legends and nowadays they're taught straightforward. So in today's world you would see uh, parents would tell their children to be careful of strangers, but uh, indigenous would tell their children this legend so that they would get the idea themselves. And uh, when um, these kind of things are happening, you do say, uh, would you do that? Or do you see what he's done? That kind of thing. So the child is learning to be careful. Okay. We Sagajak sang songs until every duck was dancing. He placed a birch bark container in the corner and announced a special duck dance. Wiesig Ajak told the ducks to get into a line and close their eyes and follow the beat. Every duck wanted to dance. Wiesig Ajak sang, the ducks are more beautiful than any other bird. The ducks danced around. Wiesig Ajak waited for the last duck in the line, grabbed it, and shoved it in the basket. Ducks fly better than any other bird. Another duck into the basket. Ducks sing better than any other bird. Another duck into the basket. One duck got a feeling in his gut and opens its eyes. He saw the basket and pushed open the lid and quacked. Brothers, sisters, open your eyes. This is all a trick. The ducks opened their eyes and saw everything for what it was. When we tell this legend to kids, we tell them that gut feeling. Trust that gut feeling. Always trust your gut. It knows the right thing to do. I'll have to act this one out. <laughs> it was a crazy teepee. Ducks were flying everywhere, and Wiesigajak was running in circles. The ducks flew around and out the door. Nothing left but a mess of feathers and a humiliated Wiesigajak. The duck that warned everyone was running for the exit. Wiesigajak ran up and gave that duck a mighty kick out the teepee door. The duck picked himself up as quick as he could, and when he stood up, he felt that kick. And you know how ducks walk? Ow, 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 All he could do was waddle away. Wiesig Ajak yelled, you'll walk that way forever, so that next time we meet, you'll be easier to catch. And that is why ducks waddle when they walk to this very day. Um, ducks waddle when they walk because their feet are like paddles. <laughs> they're great in the water, they're awkward on the ground. This legend was one of the most popular legends that I have told uh, across 40 years in every school. So uh, it's teaching kids to listen to your instincts, listen to, to your gut. If you feel something's wrong, get away as safe and as fast as you can. With the wisdom of elders passing on their teachings to future generations, we have persevered. Languages are being relearned and the powwows continue. The very essence of culture is being saved. And I was told the legend 
that uh, I said would be happening today in this in this world that I live in that I was see it. I was told the legend of hope uh, and the, the last legend is the legend of hope. So there came a time when we said gay Jack climbed up to the highest mountain and looked in all directions. East, south, and saw all the different cultures of people coming across the sea to North America, all to start uh, new lives. And Risa Gajak decided that it was time for legends, his legends to stop, and for uh, human beings to make legends of their own. And so he left, and he left us with one legend, called the legend of hope. They say that in this generation, the child will stand up for the land, the woman will stand up for the child, the man will stand up for the woman. All the four brothers, four cultures, will all come together and be as one. The entire world will change and it'll never be the same again. Now, I wasn't told if the future would be good or if the future would be bad, but I do really feel like I see a big change that's happening in this world, and uh, I'm, I'm thinking it's for the good. I'm hoping it's for the good.